Good morning, colleagues. Uh, we are, um, we'll start in, in a few minutes uh, as participants are getting in the room. Thank you. Let's wait another two minutes before we start. Okay, good morning, colleagues. Um, this is recorded, yes, perfect. So uh, this is Marie Diop from UNICEF. I'm here today again as the co-lead of the mental health and psychosocial group uh, in Eastern Southern Africa, a group which was set up in the framework of a WHO case management um, technical working group to respond to COVID-19. Um, I think we have the, um, we have the logos of all the organizations on the on the following slide. Um, today we have uh, the chance to uh, speak to Simon uh, Rosenbaum, uh, who's a Scientia Associate Professor in the School of Psychiatry. Uh, at the University of uh, New South Wales in Sydney, Australia. Uh, good, uh, what shall I say? Good afternoon, Simon. Can you hear me well? I can, sorry, it, it, good evening here. It's, good evening, yeah. even. Okay, okay. Thanks again, Simon, for uh, contributing to this uh, event. As I said, the first event organized in ESAR. 
uh, with representatives from uh, the organization that you can see uh, on the slide. And the topic that we'll focus on today is uh, physical activity and sport uh, for mental health. So we know that um, uh, physical activity and, and sport are increasing, increasingly recognized as being critical, not only for physical health, but also for protecting and promoting mental health and well-being. So this webinar will cover <clears throat> the evidence base around how physical activity uh, can actually help prevent and treat symptoms of mental illness and, and promote overall uh, mental health and psychosocial well-beings. And um, Simon will include uh, examples from humanitarian contexts, uh, including from Bangladesh and Uganda, and demonstrate how physical activity can play a positive role also as part of uh, MHPSS strategy. Uh, Simon's um, has done a lot of research uh, focusing on physical activity, mental illness, support for development and global mental health. And uh, he's worked with a variety of groups, including youth, veterans, uh, emergency service workers and refugees. And uh, he's, he's published uh, about more than 180 uh, peer-reviewed publications. So uh, Simon, um, welcome again to, to this group. Thank you very much for facilitating this session. And um, I, as usual, I invite the participants to uh, ask their questions uh, using the chat bar and, and, um, and just also take the floor and, and show their videos as, as we proceed. Over to you, Simon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for having me and for the opportunity to, to talk today. I'm really excited. Um, whenever I get the opportunity to talk about this work, it's something that I'm very passionate about. And I think it's a, it's a really exciting time globally for this idea around sport and physical activity. And, and, and really the, the evidence has come such a long way in terms of um, recognizing how critical this is to, to mental health and mental well-being even in really disadvantaged, vulnerable communities, um, there is a role for sport. And I think traditionally there's been an idea that it, you know, in, in humanitarian contexts or in disadvantaged contexts, um, you know, sport and physical activity may not be a priority. Um, but I think increasingly what we're seeing is that it can play such a positive role to, to contributing to entire communities. So I'm excited to, to share this evidence with you today. Um, and I will just ask Marie to, to jump in at any point in time and we can we can have a discussion if there's anything um, that we need clarification on. Um, what I want to start with today is this diagram that I find very helpful um, when trying to understand the difference between words that are often used interchangeably but are very different. Now, I know for the MHPSS specialists on, on the line, this won't be news, but potentially if there's any um, other people that don't have the same background, this might be helpful the difference between mental health and mental illness. Now, they do exist on these different spectrums and I'll, I'll give you examples. So on the, the, the horizontal line, we can see mental illness ranging from no mental illness to, to serious or severe mental illness. And in the vertical line, we have mental health. So ranging from optimal mental health or ideal mental health to, to poor mental health. Now I can use me as an example right now. I do not have a mental illness. Um, but it's, it's, it's late in the day here. I was very stressed about my computer working. I was telling um, Jacob that I had a laptop die on me yesterday and I was very worried. So my, my mental health, you could say, is not good. I'm a bit stressed, I'm a bit anxious. So I'm somewhere down there in that bottom right quadrant. Um, now, what we need to consider is that sport and physical activity can play an important role no matter which quadrant someone is in or no matter where they are. So that would be me down the bottom. Alternatively, we could have someone in the top right and it could be someone living with schizophrenia or living with major depression, but they are potentially, they're receiving treatment, whatever that treatment is, they're receiving treatment and at any point in time, their mental health is, is really good. They're functioning, they're living a, a contributing life. And the key point here again is to think, when we think about physical activity and sport, no matter where someone is on that diagram, it can play an important role. And this is important when we think about this concept about plus sport or sport plus. And they're terms that I've, I've borrowed from the sport for development world. And what they mean is if we think about an organization, 
So if we think about a sporting club, we have an opportunity to enhance, the, build the capability and build the capacity of those sporting clubs um, to deal with not just people that are living free of mental illness with optimal mental health. Now, at the moment, we'd say that most of the things set up you know, around sport and physical activity are targeting people in that quadrant, healthy people living with optimal mental health. As I'll show you today, with a little bit of training in things like psychological first aid or mental health first aid, we can upskill the sporting sector so that they can actually cater for people living with, with poor mental health. And they can actually ensure that we, we focus on inclusion and we reach more people and we can actually get more people access to what we know can be, can be helpful. So that's what we call sport plus. So we're adding the plus, which is the mental health training, the mental health awareness. Similarly, on the other side, when we talk about serious mental illness, and if we talk about you know, uh, mental health facilities, psychiatric hospitals, we talk about plus sport. And as I'll show you today, we know that there is very strong evidence that if we add sport, we add physical activity to the treatment of people living with, with serious mental illness, it can have a really significant effect on not only reducing symptoms, but also improving physical health, which is gonna be a big uh, topic of what I talk about today. Now, this, this question about what is mental health care? And I think, you know, for me, this is really changing and particularly in, in high resource, high income settings, we're seeing the, the, the overwhelming evidence, but also in, in low resource settings as well. And I think this diagram for me sums up my experience working in, in mental health facilities. We have these, what we call these silos of healthcare. We have physical health and we have mental health and we pretend like they're not connected. But of course they absolutely are. Um, and what we know is that poor mental health is associated with poor physical health. So people living with, with mental illness, with things like depression, schizophrenia, post-traumatic stress disorder, they're significantly more likely to experience poor physical health um, and suffer from things like obesity, diabetes, um, high cholesterol, metabolic syndrome. And those factors together actually contribute to a, a reduction in life expectancy of around 15 years. Now that isn't due to suicide, that is primarily due to premature cardiovascular disease. And they're cardiovascular diseases that we can prevent um, with, the right, with the right interventions. And we know that exercise and physical activity um, is really the, the cornerstone of, of cardiovascular disease prevention and treatment in the general population. So there's this, this dual role of, that exercise can play. Um, and so my, my, my question here, what is mental health care? What I would argue is that this can be a component of mental health care. Now, we're not saying that, that existing treatments shouldn't be used, and I can't stress that enough. The, the evidence is very clear, and nothing I'm going to argue today is going to say that we need to replace standard care. That's absolutely not true. Medication, talking-based therapy, the evidence we have, we need those existing treatments. What we will argue is that we should be adding physical activity and sport to the usual care um, of the way we treat poor mental health. So it's always an added extra. It's not something that's replacing. Um, we know that for mild to moderate conditions, so for example, mild to moderate depression, mild to moderate anxiety, in some people, in some contexts, physical activity, structured exercise may be enough. Um, but really overwhelmingly what we're talking about is adding exercise to usual care, not, not replacing. Now, there's, there's a few diagrams here. Don't get too worried about, I know it's, it's, it's late at night here and early in the morning there, so it's, it's not the time for, for diagrams, but I'll talk you through this. This is just to let you know, and a lot of what I'll talk about today, I will put the references there in case people are interested, but I'll just provide a really brief overview. Um, and this was a, a paper that we published really recently in World Psychiatry, led by my colleague, Dr. Joe Firth, um, from Manchester, where this was a big review of what is called lifestyle psychiatry. And this is an emerging field that's really capturing the evidence around these modifiable factors and, the, and their contribution to mental health. So these four factors here, you can see physical activity, smoking, that's diet on the top right, and also sleep. And this, this review outlines the evidence base around how these actually fit together. Now, I've summarised this in a, in, a, in a more simple way with some uh, a poster from WHO. It says, so cardiovascular disease risk 
is reduced through, again, the big four. We talk about the big four risk factors, so protecting people from smoking, healthy diets, physical activity, avoiding alcohol. Now, I thought that I just would make some changes to this on WHO's behalf. So we just scribbled out cardiovascular disease and I've just added poor mental health because that's essentially what the evidence tells us. You know, we know that all these risk factors that we talk about heart disease, the, the evidence is there for mental health as well. Um, and so we need to start communicating these public health messages that we've done well around cardiovascular disease and, and metabolic disease with mental health as well. And the, the, the bi-directional relationship that, that, that our minds have in our body and our bodies have on our minds. Now, one of the questions I, I always get asked is what type of exercise is best for mental health? Um, and the short answer is there isn't one. Um, really the, the best type of exercise is the type of exercise that someone enjoys and the type of exercise that someone wants to do. So I can't stress enough how, how important the enjoyment factor is. And this photo was taken in, uh, in Turkey, uh, close to the Syrian border a couple of years ago where I was working with a, a psychosocial NGO um, where we were training the MHPSS staff around resistance exercises. So muscle building exercises using these elastic bands. Now, when we talk about exercise and mental health, most people think aerobic exercise. They think we have to run, we have to get sweaty. Um, that's not the case. The, the evidence is just as good that muscle building exercises can be hugely effective, reducing anxiety, reducing depression. Um, they're also, it's much quicker to perform. It's cheap. Those elastic bands are you know, very, very cheap to purchase. And, and the evidence is here. And I'll just flash up the, the, the references in case people want to, want to look into that in more detail. Um, earlier this year, we also did a review led by one of our PhD students, Jacinta Brinsley, um, looking at the, the antidepressive effects of yoga. Um, and again, unsurprisingly, yoga was effective as well. So really the taken together, what this evidence tells us is that it's really about personal choice and finding the right type of activity for the right person, what they enjoy and trying to encourage that. Now, one of the interesting things here is about the physical activity guidelines. Um, and people that may be familiar with the WHO guidelines talk about needing to achieve around 150 minutes of physical activity per week. Now, unfortunately, those guidelines really don't take into account mental health. If they were talking about mental health, the guidelines would simply say something is better than nothing. If you're doing something, try for a little bit more. Um, and they would also talk about enjoyment. And we, we articulated that argument in, a, in an editorial led by my colleague, Megan Tashine, um, earlier this year. So talking about really for, for mental health informed physical activity guidelines, it's about doing something. Um, that's what we need to be encouraging. If people want a, a really comprehensive overview of the evidence around exercise and mental illness, um, this review by Garcia Ashdown Franks um, published this year is a is a you know the, the latest comprehensive review of, of all the evidence. <clears throat> now, when it comes to the mental health benefits of physical activity, not all types of physical activity are equally as effective. And this is a really important point. So there are essentially four types of physical activity. Um, we have recreational physical activity or leisure time physical activity. We have occupational physical activity, so what people are doing at work. We have household physical activity. And we have transport physical activity. Now, somewhat unsurprisingly, it's leisure time and transport activity that are associated with the mental health benefits. Now, if we think about that, it, it, it makes logical sense. It's got to do with agency. It's got to do with choice. Um, it's also got to do with privilege. If we think about someone being in a position where they, they have the luxury of being able to participate in leisure time activity, then there's probably other factors associated with their, their general life and um, status that they can participate in that sort of activity. Um, but we just need to be aware that we can't just simply say, look, you know, people that are doing a lot of manual labor or, or being forced to work, uh, be physically active for their job, we can't expect that to have mental health benefits as well. So high levels of occupational activity are actually associated with mental ill health um, and household activity, there was, there was no relationship. So the implications here for, for people designing programs or, or, or MHPSS sport related interventions is to really think about that, that leisure time and the transport related activity. 
Now, I just want to touch a little bit again on, on, on the evidence base that we have. So we, we do know that exercise is, a, is, is an absolutely effective evidence-based component of treatment for depression. So again, I'll just stress that we, we, the evidence tells us we should be adding exercise to usual care, not, not replacing it. Um, that top reference there is, the, is the, the latest, largest overview of the evidence base led by our colleague Felipe Schuch in Brazil. Um, the second reference is about resistance training um, and the, the antidepressive effects of strength training. Now, treatment is one thing, but probably an even more exciting avenue is the idea of prevention. Um, and there were two papers published in 2018, again, one led by our colleague Felipe Schuch. Um, taken together, they showed that if we shifted the population's physical activity levels, so if we increased our activity by as little as 60 minutes per week, so that's one hour per week of physical activity, we would prevent somewhere between 12 and 17% of incident cases of depression globally. So this was regardless of location, regardless of age. So if we think about the, the burden of poor mental health, the burden of depression, um, and we have this intervention, which is just getting people moving. Again, it doesn't matter the type. It's really just about getting that 60 minutes. It doesn't need to be in one block. It can be broken up into different, uh, you know, different 10 minute or 15 minute bouts of activity. We could prevent somewhere between you know, up to 17% of incident cases of depression. So really this is an underutilized strategy um, for prom promoting mental health and preventing mental illness. Now, severe mental illness, we, you know, this is often a, a difficult one where people think, look, people that are, that are really unwell, so really on one end of the spectrum, that maybe that's not appropriate for them to be exercising, but that's absolutely not true. Um, the evidence now is, is so strong around the role of, of physical activity um, that there are, I'll just talk to this third reference, there, there are guidelines written by the European Psychiatry Association um, in collaboration with, this is a bit of a mouthful, the International Organization of Physical Therapists in Mental Health. Um, and they released a position paper in 2018, summarizing the evidence base. Um, so really this, is, this needs to be considered as evidence-based treatment for mental illness alongside existing care. Um, now this second reference there, the, the Lancet Commission I'll just talk briefly about that. The, the, the Lancet, obviously one of the most influential medical journals, um, they occasionally have what's called a Lancet Commission, which is where they find a, a topic that's of broad international significance. Now in 2019, led by, by our colleague Joe Firth, um, they identified the physical health of people living with mental illness as a significant enough issue globally to, to write a commission. And I was fortunate to be involved um, and lead the section on multidisciplinary care. And essentially what the commission was arguing um, was that we need to be protecting physical health from day one. So as soon as someone comes in contact with a mental health service, we need to be thinking about protecting physical health. And obviously exercise, nutrition, smoking, sleep, alcohol, they're some of the key risk factors that we need to be addressing in order to protect physical health. Um, and that picture on the left of Dr. Wright here in, here in Australia is, an, is a gym in a, in a mental health facility that we have, which is now becoming part of standard care. So just like a, a patient would expect to see the psychiatrist or expect to see uh, the, the psychologist, They'd also expect to see the exercise physiologist or the physiotherapist providing that evidence-based exercise program. Now, post-traumatic stress disorder, that's a topic that's very close to, to, to my heart and a focus of my research um, and how I, I, I first started involved in this, in this topic. And in 2015, I did a, a trial looking at, at adding exercise to care for inpatients with PTSD. Um, we've done some reviews and also some work with emergency service workers. Um, one of the interesting aspects around PTSD, again, is this idea of prevention. And when we think, um, particularly at the moment with COVID, about uh, health workers or emergency service workers or even humanitarian workers, um, there's really an opportunity here for focusing on, on physical health, focusing on exercise as a way of preventing PTSD, not in all cases, but in some cases. Um, we know that that people's levels of physical activity declines over time. But we know that for people living with PTSD, that decline is much steeper. 
Um, and so it raises this idea about if we intervene early um, with exercise and we stop people from becoming sedentary, does it change the trajectory of the PTSD itself? And, and we don't have the evidence around that at the moment, but I think given what we know about depression, what we know about anxiety, it's, it's highly likely. Um, I'll just say for anyone interested in this topic around lifestyle interventions in, in traumatic stress, we've launched a special interest group through the International Society for Traumatic Stress Studies. Um, and the co-chair, Dr. James Whitworth, is, is doing some brilliant work in this, in this area as well. Now, I've just put up these two papers. This is quite an interesting um, process I was involved with. This is two papers that have been written for children. This is one of the hardest things that I ever had to write, um, thanks to my PhD student, Grace McEwen, um, for helping with that. But these two papers summarise the evidence base around nutrition and, and so what we eat in our mood um, and also exercise in our mood. And it's really written for, for, for a young audience, for around 10 to, to 14 year olds, um, summarising that in a really clear, simple way with the idea being that that's a, a group that we need to try and communicate these messages to, just like I said at the start. You know, the idea that people know that we need to exercise, we need to eat well for our hearts and to maintain our physical health but we need to be communicating the same message around, around mental health. <clears throat> now, one of the, the ways that I got involved with, with working in Bangladesh in Cox's Bazaar was this idea about prevention. Um, and this is some of the most exciting data for me, um, which is looking at among children exposed to, to ACEs, so adverse childhood events, which of course is relevant in, in humanitarian contexts. We have, we have some good data showing that team sports participation is actually protective against developing future mental ill health or future mental illness. Um, and there's two pieces of work there which, which demonstrate that. So really, I think what this, what this shows us or the potential here um, is actually thinking about sport, thinking about physical activity as not only a, a, a treatment, but also as a, the, the role in prevention and particularly for young children. If we keep these young children active, if we keep them engaged in sport, does it prevent future um, future issues from, from emerging. Now, this idea about the, the joy of movement, and I mentioned earlier about, you know, the concept about, well, in, in really vulnerable communities and humanitarian contexts, surely there's, there's other things to worry about. But I think we can't underestimate the power of sport and, and you know, this idea about the joy of movement. And there's some work that, that we did in Bangladesh. We did a, um, a rapid community assessment where we interview members of the Rohingya community living in Bangladesh to try and understand their views around physical activity and sport. Um, and some of the stories we heard were really, you know, quite, quite amazing and, and really gave us the, the inspiration to keep going with exploring this topic. Um, we heard stories of, of women in, in the camps waking up early before the men were awake and going on walking groups together. Um, we heard regularly that, that physical activity and movement was a, a way of releasing tension, which was a, a local idiom of, of distress, of trauma, of depression. Um, and what it sort of showed us was that really it doesn't matter where people live, that this idea of sport and physical activity is entirely transcultural. It, it, it goes across cultures, across languages, whether it's a, a CEO living here in, in, in the eastern suburbs of Sydney, or whether it's, it's, it's someone living in, in camps in, in Cox's Bazaar, the mental health benefits of sport and activity are, are the same. The problem is about those who, who are the ones that have access, and I'll talk about that in, in a moment. Um, we weren't the only ones doing research on this topic and some colleagues there and from, from IOM and UNHCR had also done some work around exploring the barriers to physical activity um, and how can we help more people get active. Um, something that I'm really excited about was an animation we developed in Rohingya language. Um, and this is on YouTube, it's, it's called Exercises for Everyone. And this animation was very deliberately, we had a young girl talking to her mother about physical activity. Now that was very deliberate because we know there's gender issues here. We know that typically, particularly sport, um, young able-bodied men are the ones that have access. What the evidence tells us around the mental health benefits of sport and activity is that those who stand to benefit the most are the least likely to have access. So that's women, that's people with disability. Um, often the programs that we have, the sport and physical activity programs, don't cater for those people. Um, and programs targeting mental health in those groups often neglect sport. 
and physical activity. So there, there's opportunity there. Um, so we had this young girl talking to her mother saying, look, you know, often life is difficult. There are things that are outside of our control, um, but we need to focus on what we can control and exercise is something we can control. And we have another animation. I've got to thank Sophie from Books Unbound for, for um, producing this. And we have another one that we're releasing in Arabic quite shortly um, in partnership with a NGO called ClimAid, who are providing rock climbing interventions as a psychosocial intervention in, in Lebanon. Now it raises this idea about, well, can we cause harm? Is all sport, if, if given what I've said, it sounds like all sport is, is good for our mental health. That's actually not the case. And this is a really important example from, from Uganda. Um, and this is a, a colleague and close friend of mine, Justin Richards, published this work in 2014. And I've got some photos that I've uh, got from Justin. This, this example is really important because it showed that, that running a, a physical activity program, this was a, a football competition. I apologize if I say soccer. Here in Australia, we say soccer because football means Australian football. Um, but this was a football program, but it actually made mental health outcomes worse. And it, it's really important to try and understand that we explore why that was. Um, and the reason was that it was set up as a competition when instead of focusing on participation, we fo it focused on competition and it put another level of stress on, and distress on the participants. Um, and so really there's an important lesson here for, for community groups, for providers, when we think about designing interventions um, that are using physical activity targeting MHPSS, we need to think beyond just competitions. We need to think inclusion, we need to think participation, how do we engage the most vulnerable? Um, and I can't stress that enough as an important take home. One of the key issues in, in this study was the, the coaches that we used. Because um, of course the coaches were, were doing, you know, weren't necessarily trained in, in mental health and in MHPSS. And I'll talk about that towards the end of my talk around practical suggestions that we can better integrate the MHPSS and the physical activity and sports sectors so that we get better outcomes. And we don't, um, we make sure that our, our physical activity and sport interventions are mental health informed um, and, a, and a, a set up in a way that, that give them the best chance of success and improving mental health outcomes. Now, for me, these slides are, are really important and I'm sure people have seen them before. They're, they're used often. Um, but the difference between equality and equity, and I think if we think about those boxes as the ingredients, if we think about them as the, the, the actual ingredients of a sport or physical activity intervention, um, equality won't work. And equality is giving everyone the same thing. Now, we talk about mental health. Um, it won't work because the people that are suffering the most are least likely to have access. Um, I do like this analogy because if you think about people wanting to see over that fence, um, think about it as people wanting to participate in sport and physical activity. We know that this is one of the most acceptable strategies, the most acceptable interventions we have, um, even for people living with severe, serious mental illness. We know that if given the chance, they do want to address their physical health and they want to be involved. Um, we need to think about equity, which is giving people what they need in order to succeed. So that means giving people the right access, giving the right support so that we actually help the most vulnerable to engage in, in appropriately designed physical activity and sport programs. Now, unfortunately, that's the reality, um, which is that the people who need it the most are the least likely to have access, whereas the people that probably would have done it anyways, um, and I'll use the analogy here of, of typically it's able-bodied young men they're likely to be playing sport anyways, even in really disadvantaged communities. We see that they find a way to stay active. And I'm sure everyone's seen creative ways of creative soccer balls with plastic and garbage and all sorts of things. Um, we need to think about the, the most vulnerable. How do we engage them and how do we create safe, inclusive environments so that they can participate? Now, when we think about physical activity and, and mental health, we need to think more broadly than just the participants because this has a, a broader impact on, on a whole range of factors. And in 2016, the International Society for Physical Activity and Health um, wrote the, the Bangkok Declaration, which identified eight of the 17 sustainable development goals that physical activity can play a role in, in improving. So ensuring healthy lives, promoting well-being, that's a, that's a given, but also education, gender equity, 
uh, if we think about how can sport and physical activity contribute to education, um, I can give you an example from, from Bangladesh and Coxa Bazaar. People we spoke to there um, would say that, you know, some of the teachers we spoke to said that the days they played sport was, was the, they got the most children turned up to school on those days. Um, so there's a way of engaging people there. We can use the same idea with treating mental illness, which is often heavily stigmatised. Playing sport, playing physical activity doesn't have the same stigma. Um, even here in, in Australia, we use this as a way of engaging difficult people, um, I shouldn't say difficult, but a, a way of gaining, um, engaging challenge and challenging patients in treatment. Um, we, they may not want to come and talk to the psychologist because there's still that stigma. They're happy to come and do some sport and then we can use that as a channel, as a pathway to get them engaged with the help they need with the psychologist, with the psychiatrist. Reducing inequalities, creating safe communities, um, just and peaceful societies. And on that note, a document released earlier this year um, from UNODC, preventing violent extremism through sport, another avenue about the, the potential power of sport and physical activity and thinking more broadly than just beyond the, the individual. <laughs> so this brings us to the, the IASC guidelines, which I'm sure people are familiar with and the, the, the pyramid around MHPSS. And really at the moment, the way sport and physical activity is conceptualized is as a level two intervention, community and family supports. Um, with some recognition that in some contexts it could be considered level three. <clears throat> um, really what we would argue is that actually given the evidence base we have, physical activity and sport can be considered a level three and four strategy as well. And again, it doesn't replace existing care, I'll stress that, but it, it should be added as an adjunct to usual care, even as a specialised service. Um, and the evidence there is very, very clear. We just need to find ways of translating that evidence. Now that means that we need trained physical activity providers. So trained clinicians, whether it's uh, physiotherapists, exercise physio physiologists trained in mental health, but likewise, we need the mental health sector trained in physical activity um, and aware of, of, of the links there. So how do we actually achieve recognition of physical activity as a, as a specialized service? There's three things that we, we really need to address. One is the culture. We need to change the culture of mental health services. We need to train mental health clinicians. Um, we, we do a lot of work here in Australia and also overseas where before we actually do things with patients, we target staff and we'll provide exercise and dietary interventions to the mental health staff um, for two reasons. One, it helps with self-care, which we know is, is really important. It helps create a, a mentally and physically healthy workforce. But two, it also gives them education and training so that they can see firsthand how these interventions can work. Um, so the, the training is absolutely important. And that picture was taken on the beach in Cox's Bazaar after I did some training for the IOM staff. And this was their idea, which I love. They decided to draw a brain in the sand and do some push-ups in the brain to um, come up with an idea of reflecting what they learned in the training. And for me, that was, that was spot on. It was really exciting to see. Um, and we need some level of infrastructure, um, you know, basic infrastructure, but we need some level of physical activity infrastructure within MHPSS services. And I'll just make that, that, that point here around things that can actually happen. So we have these two sectors, we have the MHPSS sector and we have sport and, and physical activity. Um, we need to enhance capability and capacity across both. So that goes both ways. Things that can be done immediately, mental health first aid training for the sport and physical activity sector. That's absolutely critical. We need to start building their capacity. Similarly, the mental health sector need to be aware of the evidence around exercise and physical activity and the impact on mental health. They also need to be aware of the physical activity guidelines and think about what their role is. Um, there's a great movement coming out of the UK um, within the, the health system talking about making every contact count. So every health professional being responsible for, for talking about these modifiable risk factors, but in particular, physical activity and, and that repetition of message. Um, we need the mental health sector, MHPSS, thinking about their role in, in preventing non-communicable, other non-communicable diseases, diabetes, obesity, um, and, and, and why that's important and the risk for, for people we're working with. Then we need to think about promoting inclusion. I talked about the, the work in Uganda and the potential negative impact on mental health. We need to be thinking about participation over competition. 
um, think about inclusion, getting more people involved. The MHPSS sector and the support sectors actually creating links, building referral pathways between each is, is really important. And ensuring that we have the right capability to match the need. So for example, if we're working with, with patients with, with severe mental illness, ensuring that we have trained professionals, physiotherapists, um, trained clinicians to provide the appropriate, uh, the, the appropriate assistance, or whether it's just working with the general community and promoting mental wellbeing, but matching the need with the, with the, the right personnel to address that need. And I think that the key for me is thinking about the person at the center of this. And I think we, we, we have to keep remembering that this is about health, this is about well-being, um, and this can have a really significant impact on, on individuals that we're working with. Um, and I'll take a, a breath and, and stop, I think. Um, I was, I, before I do, I was gonna play a video here. This is a, a really quick um, video on Facebook, but I, I won't cut through because of the technology issues. Um, but just to talk about this, this great video from UNICEF in, in Bangladesh, this young girl um, is 10 years old and her father is teaching her Taekwondo in the, the camps in Cox's Bazaar. Um, it's on Facebook. It's a beautiful video um, where you can see in her eyes where she talks about feeling empowered um, and feeling like the, the, the impact that learning Taekwondo has had on, on this young girl and her father talking about how important it is as well, which is a message we need to, to spread around, the, you know, particularly the gender issue as well. Um, for people interested in this work, there's a, a toolkit here that I, I need to mention, the Sport for Protection Toolkit developed by UNHCR and the IOC. This is a, a really, really nice resource that covers the evidence base and the role of sport in, in protection. Um, that's freely available online and is, is, is a super useful resource. Um, that work is being progressed through the Olympic Refuge Foundation. There is a think tank on sport in humanitarian settings that, that is doing some great work. And I think that it's exciting to see what will come out of that, that think tank going forward. I think there's lots of potential and lots of opportunity. And that, there's the final slide, Maria. So I'll take a breath there and happy to, to take any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Simon, for um, guiding us through uh, this research and uh, and um, highlighting, you know, all of the issues that um, more and more we're confronted to in our in our region. Um, one of the questions from the the panelists is: uh, you've, you've spoken about the importance of, of culture and how uh, you know practices should also be contextualized. Um, so considering cultural factors and perceptions, such as port being more geared toward men and less an activity for women and girls, how can we challenge those perceptions? Yeah, that's, well, that's, a, that's a great question. I think um, I should apologize about my use of sport. Um, so that's sport is only one type of physical activity. So physical activity is the broad terminology for any movement. Sport refers to structured, premeditated type of physical activity. Sport is not the only answer. So I was using sport where I should have been using the word physical activity. Okay, so for some people, sport is will be appropriate. For others, it won't be appropriate. If we're working with 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 high risk women, for example, or if we're working in a in a context where you know a competitive sporting environment is not appropriate, we need to think physical activity. Um, and even what we need to be thinking about is, is this idea of clinical exercise. Um, and that, that might involve a, a physiotherapist providing one-on-one -on -one exercise program. Um, you know, we think about this idea about exercise as medicine. Um, so we need to match the need of that individual with what we can, with what, what can be offered. But really the evidence is not about sport. The evidence is about physical activity. It's about movement. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, the other question is uh, being mindful that women and children are at increased risk of violence, and especially in times of crisis and emergencies, are there good pra practice uh, from refugee settlements in which these protection risks were successfully mitigated uh, in physical activities and sport programs? I remember, for example, when I was in the DRC, we were promoting uh, capoeira for children released of armed groups and armed forces. So yeah, do you have other examples in emergencies? Yeah, 
It's a good question. There, there are definitely examples of, of organizations and pockets of, of organizations doing great work. I would say that, that um, at the level of, of published research, we're still limited. There, you know, we're still relying on, on those examples from, from different sectors. There is a need for, for good quality research in that area. Um, what I would say is that we need to be led by the, the, the needs and the, the desires of the communities we're working with. Um, so, for example, when I was, was in Bangladesh working with the community, they don't need me to go in and say, this is how you exercise. Even, you know, the women as well, they don't need someone telling them this is how you do it. They need to be provided with the opportunity and with the resources they need to do the exercise and the activity that they want to do and that is meaningful to them. Um, so I think that's the really important point. We need to think about what's what can be done for, you know, so for example, for women, things like resistance-based exercises that traditionally aren't, we don't link with being, you know, necessarily a, a female activity, but there's lots of potential there when we think about the mental health benefits. Um, what we probably need is champions from within the community that we can train, um, training those champions to then, you know, train the trainer, they can then deliver these community interventions. But there is, there is an immediate urgent need for, for good quality research that looks at the mental health benefits of, of appropriately designed physical activity programs. I, I would say that often people running physical activity programs um, with the best intentions may not have the training in exercise science and physical activity promotion that ideally we would have. And this is why they, those sectors, those worlds need to come together. We need to look at best practice, the evidence around exercise and the best practice evidence around mental health and bring those people together. Thank you very much. Uh, two additional questions, Simon. Um, would physical activity like meditation and stretch, stretching exercise be useful to enhance people's well-being? And then um, how do we make some sport activities that require more participants be done in a safe approach in the face of COVID-19 uh, pandemic? <laughs> They're difficult questions. Um, okay, so the first question was about, um, sorry, just re repeat that first question, Marie. Sorry, Marie, can you just repeat that first question, please? Oh yeah, it, it, if, um, whether uh, physical activity like meditation and stretching was also useful to enhance uh, people's well-being. Sure. So we, we've got good evidence around yoga-based activity, so, so involving stretching. Um, it can be effective and combining it with what we call those sort of mind-body interventions, so things like mindfulness. And there is a good evidence base around mindfulness. And in fact, we can combine activity with mindfulness. Resistance training can be a mindful activity if we combine those two strategies. The benefits of combining them is that the resistance exercise will help with things like diabetes, it'll help with fitness, it'll help with our strength, in addition to the mental health benefits. But we need to think about enhancing existing mental health care. So mindfulness is absolutely beneficial. Um, stretching is a form of physical activity. It can be useful, it's low intensity, um, but it may not be enough for certain people. And this is where we need to individualize everything, look at the needs of the person we're working with. Um, we also need trained professionals in physical activity and exercise promotion to be able to help people to, to, to safely participate in exercise that will challenge them as well. And that's really important. And our bodies adapt to exercise very quickly. We need to then constantly change what we're doing in order to get the same benefit. Um, and I think the second question was about COVID. It's, it, it's really difficult, particularly with the different requirements in different countries at the moment. And it's a very um, you know, rapidly changing situation. Um, so it's, it's sort of difficult to, to answer that question, I think that would, would, would cover it um, in whole. What I would say is we need to be thinking about, you know, beyond just team-based activities, thinking about, again, resistance-based activities, activities that can be done outside that are socially distanced, um, that don't focus on that competition aspect necessarily, but that are about participation and enjoyment. Again, that key factor. And enjoyment. Yeah, you highlighted that at the beginning. Very important indeed. Um, Caroline, Caroline from IFRC, would you like to take the floor and ask your question?
Caroline, yes, perfect. Hello, Marie, thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Simon, for the very informative session. I would like to ask, um, so evidence has shown that psychological trauma from war and its accompanying PTSD can cause certain structural changes in the brain, for example, um, decrease in macrostructural, brain volume, hippocampal volumes, corpus callosum volume, for example, and this can have um, or can cause significant cognitive um, Uh, I think we've lost uh, Caroline. I, I think but I can. I'm happy to answer question. Yes, I can. I can talk to what I think she was going with uh, cognitive impairment and and should I just answer that part of it, Marie? He said, "Let me let me read what she's drafted." Uh, psychology. Oh, Caroline, are you back? Hello. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. yes, we can. Okay. Yes. Okay, so, okay. so, so um, evidence has shown that psychological trauma from war and its accompanying uh, PTSD can cause certain structural changes in the brain, which can then lead to significant diminished cognitive abilities, both in children and adults. So um, when we have these groups um, and they are able to access therapy and they get past the trauma that they would have undergone, but then they end up having the limited cognitive abilities. How can physical exercise improve mental health outcomes in, in such groups? Yeah, great, great question. Um, there's a lot that I can touch on there. Firstly, we know that exercise improves cognition. Um, even in people with, with, with severe schizophrenia, with cognitive impairment, um, exercise has an impact on, on cognitive capacity. There's a great review led by Joe Firth, um, but I'd have to check the reference, but there, there is a great review that Joe, Joe led around that. Um, you mentioned BDNF, oh, sorry, you mentioned hippocampal volume. One of the potential mechanisms that we're, we're exploring around how exercise improves mental health is around the impact on hippocampal volume and, and neurogenesis. Um, Treating trauma, for example, we, we know that, that exposure therapy is, is often used. Um, and one of the mechanisms there is increased BDNF and, and, and neurogenesis. Um, we're running a trial at the moment led by Professor Felmingham looking at exercise and, and BDNF. Um, because we know that exercise is another strategy to, to actually increase BDNF and, and, and neurogenesis. So that's one of the potential mechanisms um, that we're exploring. The, other thing you mentioned was people with cognitive impairment. How do we engage those people? And I'd say that that's where we need the, the trained professionals that are trained in, in working with that group, but trained in exercise prescription too. Um, that's what's, what's going to be really important. And the other thing that I would, would mention there is don't wait. So we've often, you know, we have this view that if someone is, 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 is um, experiencing mental health symptoms or is experiencing a mental illness, we need to wait until the mental illness is, is better before they can start something like exercise. That's absolutely not the case. If we have the right trained professionals, we can start people at the same time. At the same time, they're receiving mental health treatment, even in a, in a secure locked ward, even here in a, in a mental health intensive care unit, we have exercise physiologists, physiotherapists running programs as part of treatment. It's considered part of the clinical care. And so I think we need to change our thinking around this to do, to do the same thing. Thank you. Thanks, Caroline. Thank you, Caroline and, and Simon. Um, another question is um, um, for people dealing with, um, for people being in, in food insecure environment, and, and we know that uh, a lot of people are, you know, lacking access to, to food and, and uh, really facing food insecurity. Um, do you think that uh, physical activity and exercise is still something to recommend uh, for people who might be food insecure or, or those who've lost their livelihoods during uh, the pandemic? 
Yeah, that's a, it's a really difficult question to answer. And I, I would say that um, I don't have direct experience working with, with food insecurity. So I'm, I'm not an expert in that topic at all. And I would rely on, this is where, you know, we need to rely on people with, with you know, knowledge in certain contexts. What I would say though, is that we had stories in Bangladesh of young kids trading food for soccer balls. Um, and these were stories that were told to us by the children that we were talking to. Now, that's not to say that obviously soccer is, or football is more important than food. That's not the case at all. Of course, that's, that's ridiculous. But I think we need to think about the, the meaning of sport and activity and giving someone purpose and, and the community and the impact that has on particularly young children. Um, so I can't really comment on, on food insecurity, I'm sorry, but I think it's just something we need to, need, we absolutely is critical. Um, but other than that, that anecdote from, from Bangladesh, I can't, I can't comment on that. Thanks again, Simon. Um, I think uh, what we're confronted also at the moment is the unprecedented attention to, to MHPSS globally and the fact that we as, um, let's say, protection specialists and, and humanitarian workers have to, um, you know, take care of ourselves and, and our own self-care and well-being while at the same time uh, providing assistance and, and providing access to MHPSS services. So I believe that's where, um, yeah, even more uh, lessons learned uh, are, uh, are needed and, uh, and, and research would, would be needed as, as we proceed on the impact of this crisis overall on both, on, on, on everybody globally. Yeah, I think, you know, again, the prevention angle and you can't drink from an empty cup, you know, or pour from an empty cup, sorry. So, you know, thinking about humanitarian workers, they're absolutely at risk. And I think we need to think about physical activity being something that, that agencies can actually focus on as a way of improving the physical health, but also mental health, protecting the mental health of our staff. Um, you know, this is absolutely something that we need to think about. But often the strategies we have don't reach the people who need it. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, you know, workplace health, often they will say, here's a gym membership or something. But the people who will go are the people that would have been going anyways. It's not reaching the ones who need that support. So we need to think about how do we reach the people that otherwise wouldn't. And that includes staff. It also includes beneficiaries. Yeah. And we've had conversations this week also with um, with government representatives and uh, and frontline workers and the people working at, at points of entry um, who, who sometimes are less sensitized to the benefit of uh, you know self care, uh, mental health and well being, and, uh, and and the need of physical activity. So that's also where I think um, we should focus our attention. And um, to 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 focus on uh, on prevention and to have more research. There's limited data in many of the, the settings I believe that we're working working in, right? I, I agree, but I think we there's limited implementation data, um, but I think the efficacy data is absolutely clear. We, we don't need more research saying exercise helps our mental health. What we need is research saying, okay, how do we reach vulnerable beneficiaries in a certain place, in a certain context with a certain community? Um, and so I think that's a really important point. We have enough evidence to say enough is enough, implement. We need to start acting on this and looking at how do we implement this in the best possible way. Okay, great, great for that. And uh, obviously one of the, the, the point, like you mentioned, cultural and, and the social norms uh, component of uh, everything you've been talking about is also very important. Um, are there any other questions from the from the audience, from the participants. Um, not specifically. Uh, thanks again, Simon, for again sharing uh, this experience. And um, there was a request also to uh, access the links to the research, um, to the papers you, you showed, if yeah. possible. Yeah, sure. I can, we can work out offline how to do that, but I'm happy to provide stuff. Yep. Okay, great. And, uh, and um, let me have a look at my notes again. So I, I like the fact that you, 
you split also the different elements of physical exercise uh, from recreational to transport. So it's important to unpack ultimately uh, the opportunities to uh, also do physical and exercise and, uh, and enjoy what we're, what we're doing. They need to have uh, individualized interventions uh, that people, uh, you know, f relate to and, um, and that they also think is, is related to their own culture and environment. Um, the power of movement, barriers to physical activity and the importance of mindfulness meditation and, and also that stretching can be one element of it. Um, thanks a lot. I think uh, if people don't have any additional questions for now, maybe I can give you the, the floor again to, to close this session, which is also the last of, uh, of the week. Great. Well, thank you, Marie. I just wanted to say thanks. Thanks a lot for having me. And, and anyone that's interested, please get in touch. I'd love to keep talking. Great. And I, I would also like to extend our um, thanks to uh, Ananda, who had initially put, uh, put us in touch with you. So thanks for that connection. Uh, colleagues, this is the, the last session of um, the first ever week of uh, mental health and well-being in Eastern and Southern Africa. Uh, thank you very much for um, your participation and, and contribution to the organization of this event. Uh, we started uh, with a, a joint statement by our regional directors uh, last uh, Saturday. We then had a, a session with the regional directors themselves on Monday. Uh, we proceeded with uh, a session on uh, mental health and well-being with counselors and, uh, and human resources representatives led by um, IFRC, uh, UNICEF, uh, and, um, and, and it's a very good combination at the moment of, you know, our mental health also brings us together in our respective organizations, not only before I can say within UNICEF, for example, there was a split between the MHPS specialists and those who provide assistance and then the counselors. And now we see how uh, mental health and well-being is bringing us together. So that's very nice. On Tuesday afternoon, we had a more programmatic conversation also with, uh, with some donors, presenting how practitioners in the field have adapted uh, to, um, to respond to COVID-19, to continue to respond to COVID-19. And uh, yesterday, we had another session which was focusing more on the coordination from the government perspective to get a better understanding of what um, the government needs to better coordinate MHPSS and also ensure that their own uh, staff uh, take care of their well-being and mental health. And today, Simon has spoken about the importance of, um, of physical uh, activity and exercise. So thanks again, colleague. I, I hope it's just um, the beginning and uh, we're looking forward to, uh, to being in touch throughout the year and, and definitely touch base within a year to see how far uh, this, this has led us all together. Simon, we'll be in touch again. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mary. And have a good have a good evening to you and good rest of the day for the thank you.